classic exhibits, Kevin Carty, Jen LaBruza, our speakers, and me. Thank you very much for attending Red Talk. Our session today is about how to rebuild and reinvent our industry. I suspect you would all agree that the pandemic, as painful as it has been, represents an opportunity to shake things up. It's our chance to abandon what was broken and to reimagine what could be. We have six speakers, all with very different roles. We will hear from them individually, and then we'll open it up for questions. Feel free to submit your questions in the chat panel at any time. We will also pull from those you submitted when registering. Just a warning, the session may go beyond an hour because we've got a lot to go over. Here is a challenge we sent to our speakers, and because I want to get it right, please allow me to read it. In the live event industry in all its forms, partnerships have historically been both fluid and cozy, meaning we mostly talk to those adjacent to our businesses. For example, at classic exhibits, we chat with our distributors, a few exhibitors, various suppliers, and some service providers. However, we rarely talk to show organizers, GSCs, or venue operators, not because we don't want to, but because those opportunities are rare and outside the scope of our normal business. As a result, we don't always hear their perspective or experience their pain. That lack of communication extends to the general public and to our state and federal legislators as well. So how do we change that post-pandemic? How do we build a more transparent and inclusive live event community? There's a general consensus that the pandemic represents an opportunity to reinvent and rebuild our industry. But what does that mean? Please share your perspective on the live event industry, meaning what's your role, what that means pre-COVID, and what that could mean post-COVID. And, and this is a big and, is it possible to create an industry where all participants have a voice, where their concerns are being addressed, and where everyone is excited about the long-term viability of trade shows, concerts, and live meetings? Kevin? Would you please introduce our first speaker? Absolutely. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, our first speaker is Martha Donato. She's the founder and president of Mad Event Management, which was established in 2009. Martha has been producing uh, large-scale events and conferences for over 25 years, including pop culture events like Long Beach Comic Con and New Jersey Comic Expo, as well as numerous consulting projects, expos, trade shows, and conferences. In addition, Martha has been involved in exhibitor setup and marketing for over 20 years, having produced exhibits for events such as the San Diego Comic-Con International, the Frankfurt Book Fair, the New York Comic-Con, RIMS, and many others. So without further ado, Martha, the floor is yours. Hi, thanks, Kevin. Uh, thanks for inviting me to participate today. Uh, that, all of that sounds like what I used to do. Um, yeah, so um, that, that's all accurate though. So uh, I was asked to come in, Jen reached out to me. Thank you very much for inviting me uh, to get the show organizer perspective on the question. So um, I am though also an exhibitor in many cases, so I can hit both points for us today. Um, I was asked to talk about what the last year looked like to me as my starting point. So. We produced our last event in Long Beach, California in January of 2020. We were to produce the, the one after that in September of 2020. Uh, next step, we do two a year there. So after that would have been February of 2021, September of 2021. So uh, the, the landscape's looking right, right now like we're going to be two full years with no events. Uh, the next possible window to do an event in Long Beach is going to be February of 2022. So that has led to uh, a complete rethink of the business as show organizers. And uh, the reason um, I was able to meet Jen is during the time last year, we ended up putting together a user group. We started this in the middle of March and Steve, who's another one of our speakers here, he joined us from the very first one. We put together a group similar to this where we had um, venue operators, we had um, 
exhibitors, we had ven uh, venues, we had hotel uh, people like Steve, um, everybody. We had somebody, we had union reps come on and every week we did a meeting and we talked about where we were. Um, were, we, were we thinking about cleaning at one point? That was the answer. Then it was testing at one point. So we, we've kind of gone through the, the entire pandemic from every point of view holistically as you're as you're talking about today and that is uh, leading us to where we are now that some reopenings happening on the show organizer side of course and we've seen a few things happen and in fact we were last week at CISO we actually had 200 people at uh, Amelia Island uh, I should say I'm I am um, privileged to serve on the CISO board. So we had a board meeting and we had um, three days of content and mostly about this, about reopening and what does it look like? And what it looks like is very bullish on September. A lot of producers feel like they're going to be, re they're going to be able to reopen. I think the, the biggest challenge we have is at what size and at what cost. And we sit there with a lot of unknowns. A lot of that has to do with the region you're in. A lot of that has to do with what vertical you work in. Some are much more sensitive to all of this than others. And uh, that leaves us with, um, with a lot of unanswered questions, but also a lot of people who are, are coming together as we are today to look for solutions. Um, for me personally, I think that the only way we're going to be able to reopen in my sector, which is a consumer event, it's a very large scale under normal circumstances. I'm only going to be able to get smaller exhibitors who really need the events for their buy-sell relationship with their customers. I don't see that the larger exhibitors need to come to, to events to sell. They have other outlets to do so. And I have kept in touch with my exhibitors throughout. Um, when we canceled our September event back in June of 2020, I wrote to all the exhibitors who had deposits and said, I'll return your money. And only two said, I would like a refund. The rest said, hold my money. So I communicate with them regularly, update them on the status of where we are with reopening the building or not, because we're not. Um, just a side note, the Long Beach Convention Center is, is now, it was, a, it was a field hospital, then it was a vaccine center, and now it's a reunification center for unaccompanied minors uh, from the border. So I don't know what that timeline looks like and neither do they. But I think uh, you started this off with uh, a comment about partnership and communication, and that's where that's very critical. I have a very uh, open line of communication with the venue. I know where they are. I know uh, what they can and can't do. And that allows me to communicate with my exhibitors. And so that, that communication is critical in making decisions. Um, I'll pause. I think I probably went to my, um, my 14 minutes. <laughs> oh, you're absolutely you're absolutely fine. You hit on something interesting and, and we'll touch on this in some of the questions, but while I've got you, um, how do you, and you just came back from CISO as well, how's the, the issue of liability for organizers? What, what are, what are, the, what are the, the conversations around that and the, any resolutions that people are talking about? Yeah, that was a big topic of conversation. So I can speak um, first person for my own company. Uh, we were able to renew our general liability insurance and with, uh, it was a knockout for pandemic insurance. We will not be able to write that. And um, if you recall, after 9-11, we were knockouts for terrorism for, um, I don't remember the exact timeline, but for some period of time, we couldn't get coverage for terrorism. And then came the TRIA riders and they were quite expensive for a few years. And now they're standard. Now, you know, they don't cost a lot and we all take them. And I think uh, the conversation at CISA was around this, a similar process will happen. We'll end up being able to get a rider for pandemics, uh, but right now they're impossible to get. It's uh, what the insurance market calls a hard market right now. 
they're not wanting to take on any extra risk. Um, but some of the very large organizers had pandemic insurance and they've been paid out uh, for a lot of their losses, which, you know, lucky them, that's, that was excellent forethought and um, it's very smart, very smart of them, but they can't rewrite it now. And so we're probably in a two year window where we have to be very careful. And that makes our risk, ass risk assessment on reopening shows all the more complicated because we can say we're going to reopen and we can go to our vendors and we can go to our exhibitors and we can go to our attendees and say, here's our date, we're reopening. But if there's a reoccurrence of the virus and we end up having to shut down, we don't have any protection from that now. And, and that, that puts us in a very risky position. Sure, sure. thank you. Um, with that, let's, uh, let's move on to our next speaker. Uh, Mel, you wanna uh, introduce Steve for us all? Yes, Steve Walker is the executive director of citywide sales for the 11 Las Vegas properties of MGM Resorts International and oversees the housing needs for many of the major trade shows in Las Vegas. Steve began his career in Philadelphia in the Philadelphia hospitality community before making his way to Las Vegas, where he spent time at the Sands Expo, Mandalay Bay Convention Center, and the Bellagio, heading up their sales and strategy efforts for their group and conventions departments. Steve, it's all you. Hey, good morning, or good afternoon, everybody. Usually it would be morning, but I am not in Vegas. I'm in uh, Philadelphia today, so good afternoon. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, there were two different routes that I kind of wanted to go with, with uh, the presentation today. Uh, one was kind of the importance of what we all do, and the other one was kind of the role that a destination, a facility, a hotel uh, company has in what all we do. So I'll start with um, uh, the importance of what we do by, by quoting a few statistics. Um, and I'm gonna go back to 2019 uh, for the city of Las Vegas. In 2019, the city of Las Vegas welcomed a record 42 million visitors to the destination. And of that 42 million visitors, only 6 million were affiliated with the group and convention segment. Now, when I, when I heard that statistic, I was like, well, that sounds kind of light. You know, Las Vegas is the convention capital of the world. Um, I thought that that figure would be closer to like 50% but it is in fact uh, 6 million visitors for the uh, affiliated with the group and convention segment. So let me, let me go back to June 4th of last year when Las Vegas started to reopen. Um, we, we reopened our hotels with about 60% capacity, 60% uh, of our inventory by design to account for social distancing and just to see how we would do after being closed for a couple of months. Uh, and by the end of the summer, we had all of our properties open. But what we found, and it was, it was leisure travel, right? Because no one was doing conventions or meetings. And what we found was the demand on the weekend from the leisure travelers was pretty high. We got pretty close to selling out that 60% inventory. But midweek, it dipped significantly down in the low 20s and in some cases into the teens. Uh, so much so that we ended up closing three of our properties midweek, uh, uh, November through February. And so it kind of begs the question, what, you know, why the dip midweek? What were we missing? What, what was the cause of that? And I think we all know the answer to that question. What we were missing, we were missing those 6,000 uh, uh, group and convention attendees, right? So when I say, oh, it was only six uh, or six million, excuse me. When I say it was six million, only six million, that only six million has a huge impact, so much so that it, it caused us to close midweek three of our hotels. So um, we do see a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, you know, World of Concrete's coming up in June, Surfaces is coming up in June, and we see that kind of, uh, of the convention rebound going through the summer and into the fall. Um, as, as we probably all know, a lot of our spring conventions have moved into the fall. I'll use NAB as an example. Uh, Recon's looking to do the same. And so the third and fourth quarters uh, is kind of crunch time as far as space and availability in, in the city of Las Vegas. Um, so that's kind of a, a background of where we've been and where we're going. Um, I also just wanted to touch on, on our role in, in the meetings and conventions uh, segment is that we don't really put on events, we host events. 
right? So we, and I, I kind of go back to that, that, that movie, uh, Field of Dreams, when they say, if you build it, they will come. Um, we build this, you know, in the movie, they guys talk about building a baseball field next to a cornfield. And if they build it, all the old dead baseball players will come out and play baseball, right? But that's, that quote has been moved to big buildings, big arenas, big stadiums, big convention centers. If you build it, they will come. Uh, the challenge with what we do is we don't know who, who they are and we don't know what they will do. So, um, but we're pretty successful in doing that in Las Vegas. And our goal is to fill every week with group and convention business. And our, our teams are bold on certain amount of room nights and certain amount of catering every single week. So the pressure is on there. Um, but I see that, you know, Las Vegas is a first tier city. Uh, it's very popular. People love to come there. But I see opportunity for second and third tier cities if they are enticing and if they are uh, doing the right thing to attract visitors. So I'll kind of leave it at that and, and uh, let the next speaker go. Awesome. Hey, Steve, I have one Steve. question for you. Um, how, how are hotels um, currently, what's the outlook on, on how hotels are going to be promoting safety for companies exhibiting and holding their, their meetings? Yeah, I think um, for the city of Las Vegas, we really came together as a community. Um, uh, MGM Resorts, we have our Community with Confidence plan. It's a, it's a, like a 20 page plan, seven point safety plan. You can find it on our website and it addresses all the safety measures. Uh, you know, Wynn has one, Venetian have, has one, Caesars has one. And they, they are, if you laid them all out side by side, I bet they would all be very similar, right? Um, and, and last summer, we got together as a community, all those, those hotel companies I just mentioned, the LVCBA, Free and GES, got together and put a plan together for our state government to say, hey, this is how we would do meetings and conventions safely uh, when, when it's time to come back. We had hoped we'd be back a little sooner than what we are, but we're on the doorstep of uh, opening up to 100% capacity. Uh, and there will be safety uh, precautions and safety protocols that we'll have to follow in doing so. That was what the next the sort of dovetail question on that was sort of a crystal ball approach. I know what Syslac has said about the uh, you know, beginning of June opening. Are you, I mean, for, for your, your, your properties, are you targeting 100% um, uh, occupancy or capacity for uh, the same June 1st timeline? Uh, we are, um, but we'll, we will still look at the safety protocols and, and uh, apply those that uh, seem appropriate. Um, I don't know that all of the hotels will be at 100% uh, capacity. Uh, in, in fact, uh, and what I mean by that is the hotel room inventory will be up and running probably closer to 80 or 90% at some of them. And again, it's probably more of a challenge of hiring guest room attendance and some of the service uh, service personnel that we need to, to uh, uh, provide the service the standards that we're used to. Perfect. Keep that thought because we're going to come back and talk to every panelist sort of about uh, workforce um, development and kind of the impacts of the last year. All right. Uh, Jen, if you'll introduce our next speaker, please. Jen, you're on mute. <laughs> Of course, it would me that be me that would would stay on mute because you know I'm I'm so cognizant of that. Thanks, Mel. All right, Michael Klein with My Tech. Michael is an experienced marketing and global events manager with a demonstrated history of success working in the construction industry. He's skilled in video production, still imagery, and event management. Over the past year, Mike has been tested by the COVID pandemic and will share his experience on how MyTech has navigated live and virtual events and what he worries about when trade shows return. Thanks, Jen. So, um, you know, at, at MyTech, uh, two years ago, we were doing 250, 285 shows a year, okay? And then in January, this all just collapsed on us. We couldn't go anymore. Um, and, and for my tech, that face-to-face -face kind of conversation was, was, was vital to what we did in, in the construction industry. We were moving from uh, a software machinery company to this, this home builder energizing company, okay? We actually don't 
build anything. We write software we, uh, that designs roof walls and, and floors. Uh, we do things like uh, curtain walls on, on buildings. If you were to go back to, uh, to the New World Trade Center, that curtain wall on the outside, that's us. And it was very important for us to mingle, okay? We needed that time together. So when it hit, we, we had to back off and say, how do we keep this, this conversation going? And at the same time, for us, brand image was very, very important. You know, the MyTech brand was not real well known in the home building industry. So this building of an image was, was important for us. So, so we, we started off in the trade show sector and, and working with, with our, our partner, we developed what we felt was a very strong brand image in the in-person uh, trade show event, okay? So when it hit, we had to morph from an in-person to a virtual company, okay? And, and for us, the goal was to continue the communication and at the same time, continue that brand image, that quality visual brand image. So working with, with our display partner, we started off in that very flat 2D, almost website type of, of, of virtual event, okay? Uh, it was okay for us, we, we made it. We moved into a, a little more interactive uh, 2D PDF thing. And then we actually moved into uh, a high-end 3D virtual booth, okay? So that basically how through the, the brand image, the, the being there, how, how my tech morphed through that from, from large live events through the 2D to a 3D booth, okay? For us, the issue was still that communication. How do you communicate at these shows? Look at the way we're doing it right now. You know, a couple hundred people hanging out with us today uh, and listening to us speak. I mean, there, there is no handshaking, there is no coffee, there is no donut, there is, there is nothing, right? So, so learning to do this required a, a bit of a shift for us. So we morphed, I think, from strictly an in-person operation to one that, that learned to do it virtually, learned to make that communication jump through the monitor, so to speak, okay? So that's how we survived. So, so, so for me, the topic, you know, in, in my opinion is, is what now do we do? There's live events, there's virtual events. How does that work out for my tech? You know, what, what, what does the future look like for my tech virtual versus, versus live? And, or is it a hybrid event? And, and we actually get to find out in four weeks. We're actually going live in four weeks. I've not been anywhere for over 13 months. I used to travel quite a bit. I've sat right here for 13 months. You're looking at one guy who's really frank about going somewhere. But at the same time, this is a live event down in Miami. We're running a virtual event at the same time. So we're finally gonna get to make those two things and, and see how things work out for us, okay? Um, what's interesting about it is, is now the way we approach a live event as an exhibitor, okay? Uh, our budget was strictly live events. And, and now going forward, we've discovered multiple ways to get that brand message across, to get that communication across. And as we go forward, we now no longer look just at a live event. For, for us, what's going on is do we, you know, what, what do we have digital? You know, uh, how do we continue doing live events and, and virtual events? And, and our, our dollars have become spread over digital printed sponsorships. It, it's amazing the number of sponsorships where we, we've been able to get a speaking engagement and put out that message. And, and for us, putting out that message is, is the most important thing. So what, what my tech is asking themselves going forward, what is the value of the spend at a live event, at a digital event, sponsorship? That, that's what we're asking. And, and part of that ask is, when I go digital, what are my pain points? When I go to sponsorships, what are my pain points? And when I go live, what are my pain points? And where do I have control and how can I manage those? So going forward, and let's just talk live events, 
uh, you know, there are pain points. I'm on the other side of the curtain, right, guys? I'm on the show floor. Uh, I'm looking for opening day. And, and, and there's pain points that we've got to deal with. And I think the industry as a whole has an opportunity to improve, to change those pain points for, for exhibitors like me. Pain points such as labor, quality of labor, customer service, and understaffing. You know, when I, when I need help in my booth on the floor, I need it now. I don't need it in three hours. So, so that's a staffing issue for me. So it's those kind of things that are going to cause us to match that value of the spend versus digital versus in person. I can't wait to go back live. That's exciting. <laughs> May 15th is going to be a blast. Okay. That's exciting. Awesome. That's exciting news having the, having an event on the calendar, being able to go. I'm curious, you, you talked about the balance between live and virtual in the in the hybrid world. Is there one or two things that you've just intuitively as a as a marketing team already decided, yeah, this this is gonna go in the virtual space and this is gonna go in the physical space? Mm -hmm. Well, what, you, you know, those, those 250 plus shows that we were doing prior to the pandemic, uh, or some of them were very large shows that, that require an in-person event. You know, any, the IBS show, we do PCBC, we do a, a show called BCMC. Those are shows that require our event, right? Our, 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 our being at the event. When you look at those other shows that travel in the, in, in the far distant orbit, those shows have become have become virtual for us, okay? There's a lot of regional shows. We deal with a lot of building inspectors, engineers, architects. These guys have no problem going virtual. So it, it's more of a regional show for us is where we, we see it going virtual. It's the large nat, na, national shows is where we're gonna, at the very least, be in person, but, but look at the potential of a virtual event, a hybrid event here. All right, thank sure. you, appreciate that. Um, I'll introduce our next speaker. Um, our next speaker is Mike Davis. Mike is the uh, COO of uh, Court Business Services, a Berkshire Hathaway company. Uh, Mike oversees all aspects of sales, operations, retail, supply chain, uh, product development, real estate purchasing, marketing, and new business development, uh, both in the U.S. and the U.K. Uh, he helped start Court's trade show and events uh, uh, business, uh, events business over 20 years ago, having come uh, from the trade show industry. Mike has served on uh, various industry boards, including EDPA and ESCA. So Mike, with that, talk to us. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, I'm, I'm exhausted hearing all the things that I have to do on a regular basis, so I, I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, we're, we're a, uh, I think we're just, a, I don't think we're unique, but we might be in the fact that we um, straddle so many of the customer segments within the trade show and event industry. Uh, many of you on this call are our customers. Um, many of you I've met in person. Some of you were with me in, or I, were, I was with you in um, a Euro shop in February last year when the uh, first domino dropped, which was, um, I forget the conference in Barcelona that involves all the cell phones. And uh, we all sat around a table at dinner that night thinking, Okay, what's our prognostication? Is this a couple of months? What does this mean? And to a person, we got it wrong. Not one of us was even in the ballpark of, of what this would end up doing and, and affecting in the industry. Um, one of the things that you had, had mentioned in the beginning when we talked about some of the uh, things to consider in today's call was you know, where are we spending our time? As an organization, uh, one of the things that we recognize is, is there's going to be two phases of this in our view. The first phase is how is this going to come back and when? And the second phase is what is that going to look like? Because we're all very interested to see what attendance will be, what how many exhibitors will come back. And in many cases, we have these unique, we have these unique circumstances of where people prepay for their booths and for their exhibits. And as a result, the first wave may or may not give you an indication of how the business is gonna transact going forward. And so I, I think as we all recognize that it's just very difficult, I, I often say it's like trying to nail jello to the wall. 
uh, right now to, to get an assessment of what this is going to look like. So from an organizational perspective, we're spending a tremendous amount of our time doing what I want to believe we do a lot of, but the reality of is we didn't do enough of, and that is getting close to our customers and really understanding what has changed, if anything, with them and having an engagement perhaps at a different level. Um, often as a supplier, you try to sell your services and you try to find a connection with the customer, but you don't necessarily deeply understand their business in a meaningful way and ask questions that are different. I mean, we went to our sales organization and had them kind of tell us what are the common questions that we were asking before the pandemic occurred. And then we put those together and I said, what's missing? And we ended up coming up with a, a, a completely different view of the things that we're interested in and we, we really need to know as we go forward. And so it's really changed uh, in some ways our, our philosophy of how we wanna to go to market and engage with our customers in the sense of what we want to know about them and what is important because those priorities have changed and they'll continue to evolve. But everybody's priorities, uh, at least speaking for me, my priorities today and for the next six months are dramatically different than when they were in 2019. And as a result, our customers are certainly have changed. And we've seen business models. We've seen our customers adapt and do different types of businesses, get into verticals that don't have anything to do with the trade show and event side of the business in some cases. And in other cases, move into to areas that are unique and different that we may not have had exposure to. So. Um, a, a serious amount of our time is really spent trying to engage our customers in a different way, and that will continue. I think that's going to be one of the positives that come out of this. And tying that together is because we sit at this interesting intersect as a supplier of where we, we deal with almost every aspect, from the venues themselves, to the hotels, to the show organizers, to the general contractors, to the exhibit houses, to the individual you know, exhibitors themselves. Uh, we have a chance to see a, pers a, a um, maybe a, I wouldn't say different perspective, but perhaps a wider view of, of how all of this interacts. And in the end, it's what we recognize is that the customer tends to be all of our customers, meaning the exhibitor, the attendee, you know, that's where it all flows from. So that, that's the tributary, if you will, and from everything else comes with it. And when we serve our partners' needs, we are in basically serving those customers' needs. And what we've recognized is there's so much commonality in what everyone's trying to achieve um, that we, you know, sitting on the boards of ESCA and sitting on the boards of EDPA, it's very interesting to see that there isn't a lot of diametrically opposed things that we can accomplish in the industry. There are certainly different business objectives, and that is a real and concrete reality. And what you're trying to get out of the business in the end, in other words, whether it's profitability, growth, you know, ownership of certain segments, I think that tends to be more of the challenges for us as an industry than it is the, the common things that we want to do that's best for the customer. It's trying to figure out if there's only one dollar, if there's one dollar of revenue, how does that work and, and, and how many people are involved and so on. But, but I will tell you that in my conversations with various aspects of this industry, people that represent, as I said, whether it's general contractors or show management, show organizers or exhibit houses, there are far more common um, uh, objectives and goals, then there are those that are opposed. And so that, that gives me a lot of positivity that those things that are really um, irritants in some ways and stopping the growth potentials uh, of the industry from a customer standpoint can be resolved. And we all know what they are and we don't need to name them. I mean, we could come up, we could all come up with three or four of these that we've been talking about as an industry for probably 20 years. And in some cases, those barriers are coming down because companies have decided that there's a different way to do it. 
And I think that's probably the thing that is self-evident and obvious. So I'm going to be the COO of, of, you know, master of the obvious in this. But doing different is a tremendous opportunity for us as an industry and also for companies. You know, there's the old adage, never waste a good crisis. And it really gives everybody an opportunity to affect change because culture will trump strategy every time in organizations. And it will do that in industries. And when companies and organizations and industries are on the precipice, it really gives people an opportunity to say, okay, this is something that's meaningful. We need to do this. And there's a, there's a commonality. And in all the years I've been in this industry through, you know, Y2K through the dot com bust through you know 9 11 through 2009. This is the only event that has been equally punishing across the enterprise for the industry. That has never occurred. It was very segmented. Some did better, some did worse, but it was not equally distributed the way that it is. So I, I think this is a tremendous opportunity for um, companies because that's where it will start and organizations associations you know to figure out what will be the catalyst for growth as we go forward what will be the engagement that we need to have at the customer level in order for the industry and all of us to succeed because all boats do rise i mean we've seen that we saw that through you know 2005 to 2009 before the crash so i'm very hopeful you know, from an industry standpoint, I know there are things we can do. Um, Chris and Dasher, I'm sure, are going to touch on the advocacy side, which I thought I was a fairly decent advocate. And what this taught me was I didn't know anything. <laughs> I did never understood the depth of all of the different components. You know, we have a party rental company in the Pacific Northwest and do tenting. So we're with ARA. We belong to all these different associations. And I never knew how uncommon, you know, our representation was for common things. In other words, that we were just not seen um, the way that we should be seen as an industry. So another thing that came out of this, but um, there you are. There's my five minutes. Plus. Thank you very much, Mike. I'm gonna come back to you as well when we talk about one of, you know, two of the concerns that I think we've all had um, is throughout this, event we've been going through is um, the, the workforce development. I want to talk about that towards the end with the whole panel, um, as well as supply and demand issues um, uh, coming out of this. But I will move on um, to our next speaker. Uh, Chris, you want to, or uh, Mel, you want to give uh, Chris, a, well, give him an introduction. <laughs> well, you know, I have the pleasure of introducing Chris and it's self-submitted bio. So let, let me read that. Chris is the owner and president of Crew XP. His turn-ons include, I'll, I'll give you that pause here for a second, elected officials who have actually heard of the trade show industry, large government grants and low interest loan programs for small business, and large in-person gatherings that help the world trade. In addition, he's the past president of EACA, He's currently Vice President, Industry Advocacy Chair of the EDPA, and the recent winner of the EDPA Ambassador of the Year Award. Chris is a current and active board member of the newly formed ECA Exhibitions and Conferences Alliance. And that's Chris. It's all Did yours. we leave out Vice President of Nonprofitable Behavior at my company? I'm, <laughs> I'm applying for that position at any of your firms that are hiring. Thank you, Mel, and I, I appreciate the invitation to be here. I appreciate the wisdom of the three pages of notes I've already taken listening to the speakers so far. Um, Kevin, I love your first question. Is it possible for all stakeholders that, or Mel to have a voice, right, is, as we build back? I think the answer to that question is yes. Uh, I think the question part two of that is an equal voice. Maybe that's not as easy but I, we certainly need to make sure um, that there, there is a voice. Martha, you mentioned, you reminded me, smaller exhibitors that need the show for their buy-sell process. That's what we're gonna maybe be seeing early. I totally agree with that. Many of you that I've, I've um, 
caucused with here before. Uh, we know this is going to be um, an uneven recovery. We know it'll be lumpy. It'll be uneven by region. It'll be because of politics and, and state legislation and guidelines. It'll be uneven by vertical market because some have migrated to other places, other mediums that have been more successful uh, than, than uh, others. I think there's no question there are lots of surprises in store uh, for us to get to what I call meaningful recovery. Um, I know how frustrated every one of us has been, myself included. I would, I would, um, I would re remind you, here's what I say to myself every day. This is what recovery looks like today. And somehow it seems to be a little bit better when it isn't going the way we all wish it were. And I think we're gonna be saying that to ourselves a lot in the coming months. It looks different today than it did four months ago. I feel like the calendar activity that we're seeing feels a bit more substantive, like there's a better chance. And I mean, at the root, the root of it, guys, is we, we all know what has to happen for the business travelers to come back. We need wide distribution of the vaccines and that's happening, right? We need inoculations to be going up and climbing and that is happening, right? And so, um, and ultimately we need the, the, our guests' confidence. And by guests, I mean exhibitors and attendees um, to feel comfortable, not just you know hearing that the show is happening, but going to the airport and getting on a plane and then going through another airport and experiencing a three or four day strange hotel experience and having the different restaurants they go to and then reversing all that. So there's a lot of variables that have to kind of add up here. Um, you know, other, uh, those of us that are, you know, and it's, and it's exhausting. I, I mean, I'm, we're surviving right now and we're also trying to, to build our businesses back for reopening. And, uh, you know, I'm like every one of you guys and that is I'm collecting uh, beams and, and planks to build my bridge to recovery. Um, you know, some of us might have a lumber yard in our backyard. Others of us, <laughs> right, we're collecting these things as we go with every quote and estimate that comes through. And the exhausting part is you just don't know how long that bridge has to, has to be. I remember as a kid watching, if you know the name Evil Knievel, remember that, that jumping over the Snake River Canyon and you just go, First of all, I mean, that's, it feels a bit like that. How long out there do we have to keep building? Um, but there are signs of actionable recovery right now. So that's a good thing. And so I think the conversation needs to pivot at some point. I'm looking forward to putting the term recovery away and we can begin using words like reopen and rebuild and uh, realign uh, for our customers, um, like Michael, it's how do I reactivate, right? That, that pipeline with, you know, the more meaningful face-to-face uh, -face encounter leads, uh, you know, the Glen Gary leads, remember that movie, right? Give me the Glen Gary leads. I want the good leads. Uh, we know that happens with face-to-face -face encounters. So we need more of that. I've chosen to throw myself with my partner, Dasher Lowe and I into advocating for our industry. Um, you know, why is advocacy, my, my biggest fear, and Dash and I talk about this, is that um, we're gonna get something at some point, our, our federal assistance, legislative assistance is going to stop. Um, and we can maybe come back to that in the Q&A a little bit, but um, you know, that's, that is going to happen, but we cannot stop advocates, advocating. It was Dr. King who taught us all that, uh, you know, advocacy is not an occasional event. Right? It is a constant attitude. We have to continue to advocate. And I would, if you if you are listening on this call and you're questioning, you know, is that really true? 9/11. Um, okay, our our industry was shuttered for three or four months. Uh, poll results from Center for Exhibition Industry Research, my friend Kathy Breeden, tells us it took four years for the economy, our economy, to get back to that 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 level before 9-11. The Great Recession of 2009, it was 10 years before the economy recovered to the pre-October 2008 level, 10 years. And now you look at what, what's happening now 11 years later, I'm calling this the Great Disruption, 
And just, you know, this feels even deeper than those things. So, you know, 9-11, eight years later, the Great Recession, 10 years later, this great disruption. There's going to be something else that happens in the future, but let's not be the invisible industry anymore, right? So now we have to, now we have to talk about um, making sure those relationships may, are maintained and continue. So that's what we're working on right now. We've had some, uh, we obviously have some asks that we know we need. Um, financial help is what EDPA has been focused on for the small business service providers, the builders, the designers, all those folks in our lane. We're also very active. EDPA is a shareholder member of the, uh, what you all remember is the Go Live Together Coalition. Uh, it is now morphed and evolved into a formal entity called the Exhibition and Conferences Alliance. Um, you know, EDPA is focused on, you, you, you know, you hear a lot about our, our government affairs advocacy that will continue, but we're also focusing on exhibitor ag advocacy. Uh, and that's gonna be a major topic this year. If you haven't seen that white paper that um, a group of brand side exhibitors put out, they are telling us how they feel right now. And that is such an important voice. I mean, if you think of, those are the folks at the center of the circle, right? All money that everybody on this call makes emanates from those exhibitors and sponsors. And right now, um, they're just asking for a voice and to be um, included in any talks and improvements as we build back this industry that completely vaporized 13 months ago. But the great news about something that vaporizes is you're talking about you know, being able to build back. We don't have to build it back with all the bad habits. Let's give those folks at the center of a circle a voice. They're not hiding from the actual costs. They know that there's costs associated with this, but they are needing transparency. And I'm sure I'm speaking on, on Michael's behalf when, when I say his life would be a lot easier if he's able to forecast what those expenses are uh, as he goes to his higher ups and says, you know, sorry, I'm 53% over budget again for this live in-person event. So. We think there's a way to bring everybody to the table and have these discussions. Um, this isn't price fixing. It's not, you know, we're not talking about price gouging. We're talking about everybody who has an interest in this, this recovery happening, which by the way, I 100% believe will happen. There's no question. Um, we will see a thriving, robust, face-to-face -face, uh, event again. I, I had a great analogy the other day on a call and they talked about a group of kids. You know, you, I, I see them, in my neighborhood, we've got a playground in my neighborhood that's just packed all the time. So, but if it rains for a week, right, and the kids stay home, or let's say rain for a month, right, all of a sudden the kids aren't going to not want to go to the playground again, right? They can't wait to get back there. And so we have a lot of pent up demand, but we know that this this is what recovery looks like today. It's on it's uneven, it's lumpy. Um, there will be some shows this fall. Um, maybe 60% exhibitors, 70% will come to one show, maybe only 50% will come back at another. Maybe only 15% of the attendees will come back for the first show. Uh, maybe 25% will come back. Um, we, you know, those are the things we have to watch, it, which means there'll be 25% of the build work. There'll be 25% of the labor work. There's gonna be less work for all of us. So my suggestion is don't abandon your pivot yet. Um, we still are lobbying uh, with EDPA for, uh, in the near term, for a long-term working capital loan or grant product to assist our small businesses uh, with enough funding to not just make it another round of paychecks, but to relaunch and get through this long bridge into 2022 and 2023 when cash flow will pick back up. Help us clean up our balance sheets, right? So we can go back to banks and get what's called the line of credit because nobody can do that right now because nobody has uh, receivables, nobody has a balance. It's gonna, it's gonna have to, it's gonna have to be assistance with things like that. So, uh, in the meantime, ECA, the the macro organization, we're pushing hard right now for the Hospitality and Jobs Recovery Act. That's looking very good. There are a lot of tax credits. Uh, it's not cash, but there's a lot of benefits for the business brands business travelers, uh, when they spend money, there's all kinds of great tax deductions. They're being incentivized to help them come off the sidelines quicker and get back. So 
Uh, if you're wondering what you can do for advocacy, number one, I would say continue to support your associations, whichever one you're a member of or all of them, they've never been more important. They're doing great work this year. Mike mentioned ESCA and uh, we work closely with them with EPA and IAE. We are speaking as one voice. That's one of the great things that's come out of this is we've learned to speak with one voice and we're doing a much better job helping our elected officials understand who we are. So um, we got to keep that up. Uh, our chapters, uh, we're talking to them about getting involved at the local level, making sure we don't give up shaking the bushes and making sure they know who we are. And here's another thing. If you do have a relationship started with an elected official, make sure you're not just asking them for something. You know, if you catch him doing something right, let him know that. I know uh, Rob Cohen, who's a, obviously a board member of EDPA, a friend to all of us. Um, this is a man who sent out, I don't know how many emails on January 7th after that uh, storming the Capitol uh, to make sure all of those officials and the staffers that he spoke with, that they were okay and their families were okay. You know, we're, we're, we're the perfect industry to advocate guys because we're all tremendous salespeople. Right. And that's what's needed right here. We know that sales is about developing relationships and relationships are based on multiple contacts that are meaningful. Right. So let's let's make sure we're making those deposits, not just asking for withdrawals. Uh, Mel is secretly texting me that he's getting the hook to pull me off. My five minutes of fame is over. So I'll turn it back over for any questions or maybe Dasher wants to add, add to uh, the advocacy topic here. Go ahead, Jen. Yeah, let me just introduce real quickly Dasher Lowe, Executive Director, EDPA. Dasher has been the Executive Director for the Experiential Designers and Producers Association since 2018. He is responsible for delivering value to EDPA members, of which many of us are a part, and helping grow the association. Dasher is focused on delivering initiatives that support EDPA's four key pillars, advocacy, education, networking, and good works. And without further ado, I'm gonna introduce Dasher Lowe. Thanks, Jen. And uh, note to everyone, never follow Chris. He's always a tough <laughs> one. So. <laughs> no, as, as, as Jen mentioned, EDPA is really about those four pillars, advocacy, education, networking, and good works. And, uh, you know, my job is to facilitate and coordinate uh, those efforts across our awesome team of, uh, of volunteers. And, and many of you uh, on this call here um, help facilitate um, those. Um, our mission hasn't strayed in the last year at all. Um, what's changed is really our priorities and our strategies on, on, on getting those done. Um, you know, Chris spoke a lot about our advocacy efforts and, and, uh, and really how that's really become our priority over the last year. Um, you know, it's no longer uh, about putting our hat on once a year um, for Exhibitions Day and, uh, and doing our March on Capitol Hill. It's really about what we've realized, and, and as Mike said, uh, what we thought we knew what advocacy was, it's changed. And it's really about um, continuing this fight and, uh, and doing so 365 days a year. Year. Um, you know, the biggest thing I think we all realize as an agent, as an industry, is that the whole idea that we are kind of this quiet giant um, is actually not a good thing. Um, our voices need to be heard. The fact that we support $100 billion to the economy, um, employ over 2.8 million people directly, um, is, is a huge deal and it needs to be heard. So we will continue our fight um, on the advocacy um, level. Um, like I said, our priorities have changed, but we're gonna continue to deliver the education um, and networking opportunities. I, you know, Our chapters have done a great job over the last year um, and, and taking on this networking challenge of how do you get people together to communicate and talk. Um, you know, I, I see a ton of familiar faces on the screen right now um, through all the chapter Zooms and communications that, that, that we're having. EDPA was one of the few live events that happened last year, our access event uh, in San Antonio. We thought it was critical that we get the, the industry together and talk about um, really the facts facing recovery and be able to share information and have those hard, dis hard discussions. Um, and our good works with, um, in partnership with our, the EDPA Foundation, that continues. Um, now more than ever, it's, it's, it's needed as, uh, you know, um, 
companies and, and, and individuals uh, try to recover from the, from the impact of this. So we'll continue our, our mission. Um, and I think, you know, the biggest change for us is that, you know, as Chris and Mike have both said, advocacy uh, is a habit. It's got to be a, a full-time job. And, uh, and with the help of, uh, of Chris and, uh, and Rob and, and a number of other uh, uh, partners within the EDPA, we're going to continue that fight. Thanks, Dasher. Well, um, appreciate all of you. Let's move on to uh, some questions. I know some people are, are having to, um, to leave, so I want to get a few questions answered. Gentlemen, I have you um, uh, take over any that might be in the chat, uh, but just to jump off with real quickly, let's talk, go right to workforce because um, there's probably not a single person on this call that I haven't had at least some sort of one of these meetings about where workforce concerns come up. Um, so I guess to the panelists as a, as a whole, um, a lot of the questions around workforce revolve around how do we restaff as an industry and how's that, how is, how is that progression going right now? So um, I'm gonna just sort of cherry pick a little bit and I'm gonna go to uh, Steve first. Um, from your perspective, you know, restaffing for what you were talking about in, in June with um, you know, Vegas opening up uh, in, in a much more meaningful way. What does that look like, and how's that? How's that? Uh, how's the progress there? Sure, and, I, and I'll kind of touch on it from a Mandalay Bay perspective because Mandalay Bay has the convention center attached to the hotel complex, and uh, it's been dormant for the last uh, 13, 14 months. I guess it's 13 months by now. Um, had a few events in there, volleyball tournaments, and all that sort of thing, but. To host a volleyball tournament, you really don't need the servers, you don't need the house and that sort of thing. It's kind of like, here's an open uh, area, set up your volleyball course and do what you got to do. Um, so now we're gearing up to, to, like I mentioned earlier, the surfaces event in mid-June and, and that hiring process we expedited, but it's still a challenge to, to get the, the workers back the employees back that we had before. And, and we mentioned it already, some, some have moved on, some have moved out of uh, the location, some have moved on to other, other uh, careers, um, but it's gonna be a process. And, and it's not good news, but I think it, it's, it's uh, kind of the way we're gonna ramp up is the way the shows are gonna ramp up. Like surfaces isn't gonna be 30,000 people this year, it's probably gonna be more like 10. Or, 20, or, or, or 15. So we don't have to staff up like we would for a surfaces from 2019 or 2020, which kind of got in before the shutdown. So um, that's that's the challenge. We're doing work, we're doing uh, 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 job fairs, all that sort of thing. And really it's the it's the frontline employees that uh, that we need to hire back, the, the server, the, the folks that are in front of the guests that are coming in and the exhibitors and the, the attendees, those are the folks that we have to hire. You know, one of the elephants in the room that um, it can become an uncomfortable conversation, but um, if we, you know, I think it's a conversation that needs to continue to have is um, <clears throat> all the positions that you just mentioned rarely get mentioned as a part of this conversation. When people think of workforce development, whether it's a customer's thought process or even some of our own thought processes, we, we automatically go to um, the, the, the guys and gals on the floor that are setting up the exhibit. And, and which are critical, absolutely 1000% critical. Um, and there's, there's some, um, some effects there that have to be addressed as well as, as getting those folks back. But oftentimes I think we get stuck in this space of, well, you know, um, the, we've got a pool of 2000 people in Vegas and they're all ready. They just need shows to come. Yeah, but the servers, the, 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 mm -hmm. all the other positions that you just mentioned, and then you tie it to the, to the, to the hotel and the whole hospitality side of it. And, and, and there's, a, there's a large swath of people that, um, as you said, have not come back and may not come back. And they're not easy jobs to train for. These are specialized talents. And, and when they do come back, everybody is going to have to be retrained because you're not coming back to the same job that you did 13 months ago, especially with the health and safety protocols. Everyone needs to be educated on what that looks like. And that's a big job. It's a big job for our operating departments in all of the hotels. Agreed. Martha, um, your thoughts on, on restaffing and, and sort of the progress there. Um, yeah, so that is going to be a problem that, and we've been talking a lot about it. And I think, you know, Steve, Steve just said they're doing job fairs and, and things of that nature. Um, 
we don't have that same benefit of being able to do that because we're not in a, in a stationary location. So we're counting on our networks and reaching out to, um, to our associations, uh, which, which are critical. And that's been the theme that's woven through this whole conversation has been affiliation, networking, um, your associations. That's, that's what we're going to have to lean into when it comes time for um, rehiring. And hopefully the people will, will want to come back to work. Exactly. No, thank you. He, um, I, I want to move on to business indicators really quickly um, and tap into Mike Davis first. Um, what are some um, indicators that uh, both court as an overall um, um, uh, business, but then even you, you personally that you're looking at um, to sort of measure and gauge what recovery looks like? Oh, first and foremost for us, it's activity. Um, you know, being able to see like a, you know, is this a tidal movement? Is this sort of a tsunami? Um, we certainly are seeing everything that's been mentioned on this call with activity. Um, the, the challenge is we're, we're, we're actually, I don't know if anyone else is experiencing this, but across our, our organization, which serves various different verticals besides trade show and events, we're seeing an incredible amount of activity. What we're not seeing is results. And so we're spending a tremendous amount of time quoting and assessing and talking about the potential. And what's happening is, is that it's, it's, it's kind of stuck in gear, if you will, is that um, it's not manifesting itself in a material way yet. So on one hand, the activity is a good indicator of some momentum, but we haven't reached that tipping point yet. And so what's going to have to happen is, is to, to use a euphemism from when I lived in Vegas, Steve will appreciate this, we have to decide when I'm going to push the chips in. And so for us, we're starting to do that, is that we're going to make some bets. Um, now, we're in a, a good position because of who we're owned by. And I recognize that a lot of people are not in that position where they have the ability to have the financial backing to make some of those decisions and survive if you get them wrong. So it's a very different scenario depending on what your situation is. But for us, we feel that's going to be the, the biggest uh, challenge is when to push that in. And it goes back to what we were just talking about from a people standpoint. Um, we had to make the reductions we had to make. Um, look, we had a challenge because we're a very operational company. We had a challenge before the pandemic. I mean, trying to find drivers, uh, it, the Amazon effect has been in full force for about three to four years. And if you're running operations, trying to find people in general, whether it's supervision, but it's certainly the warehouse people and the people driving, that was a challenge long before this. This has just poured fuel onto it. Uh, and so what we're doing is, is that we're placed, we've placed our bets. We are hiring. We're going to continue to hire. And if we overstaff, so be it. Uh, simply because I don't think that that's going to change. And in fact, when the industry gets going again, which it will, this is going to be a really, really big challenge. And the fact that all of my customers are going through this, I also recognize where the, um, the ball stops rolling <laughs> and who, who gets to deal with that. And so, you know, we're having to take that into consideration too, to say, look, our customers are going to rely on us more than they had before for certain things because they don't necessarily have the resources to put in play where they can backstop it. My, you, you hit on something um, and I'm gonna leverage something that Brad said here in the, in the, in the chat as well. Um, you know, issues with, you know, finding drivers and workers pre-COVID. Um, we've had this problem for quite some time. And it's been, it was a conversation on the UDPA board for Quite a, quite a period of time as well. Um, and, you know, uh, one of the notes here Brad's putting would be useful to have empirical data on how many per, are permanently gone and, and how many we think uh, will be needed over time. I know myself, I've had some direct conversations with um, uh, uh, state legislative folks um, in, in a couple different states trying to get that data and trying to figure that out. I've gotten some unemployment rules recently to, to kind of look through and um, it helps a little bit. There's some data that can be found, but um, 
you're right, we need that data. But I'm gonna lean on Chris a little bit on the, on the workforce development because we, we had an age factor coming into this already um, within our workforce. Um, and then as Mike said, we just, you know, we had a, a big old uh, bunch of gas poured on the bonfire. Go ahead, Chris. No, you, you, you're right. And I saw Brad had alluded to this. So we were, we were tackling the workforce thing a couple years ago not that it hasn't amplified now, but so we know that we have an aging population that works on the show floor. And what we also heard was in a lot of backroom shops in the builder operations, right? So on the show floor between 56 and 58 years old, it's the average worker on the show floor. Um, the, the flip side of that was this, the, the younger generation, 30 and under, 98% of them have never heard of us. So as we're trying to activate that talent and bring them in, you know, we realized much like Congress, right? We have this huge creative talent pool that never, never thinks of us for jobs. So um, now add hundreds of thousands, if not more, of displaced tenured seasoned workers, which is what we're facing right now. Look, the U.S. economy is about to start growing at a much more faster pace with hiring set to pick up. We know that $2 trillion was just approved in the American Rescue Plan. That's going to be hitting the economy this year. That's going to drive some hiring here. Um, the challenge for our industry, I think in the next 12 to 18 months, and I, I acknowledge this is a challenge. I don't have an answer. I'm putting this in the category of this is what recovery looks like right now, but we'll, we'll figure this out is that we are about to have a 180 degree reversal of the supply and demand principles that we all know to be true. So in the past 12 months, right, we saw 2.8 million uh, business event workers displaced or unemployed because there was zero demand. Well, the supply of talent was enormous. So now we're getting indicators that demand's gonna be spiking up in the near term, maybe this fall, but the supply of qualified and the experienced talent is in short supply because of the nature of our circumstances, which are number one, demand is going to be sudden and it's gonna be inconsistent. Um, so it, meaning it's not full-time people we're gonna be bringing back right away. We can't do that until we feel the recovery is a little further along. The supply inventory, which is the people have either found an acceptable employment option somewhere else, or they've got a government pay option, way more than they've had before, state and federal assistance, which we now goes through September, um, which affords them the ability to remain on the sidelines for at least another four months. That is hampering our recovery. Employer companies, uh, and we're in this category, can't run back and rehire full-time positions until we start to see that the market demand is more consistent, is more constant. So this typically means it's good for freelance and consulting work, which by the way, is always a part of any economic recovery, right? So when you look at, so that's a good indicator, but it's not a great thing for employees that are looking for security and employment stability. So that's the challenge that we're, we've got probably through the rest of this year, uh, maybe into next year. Um, you know, would it have been better off if there was no federal unemployment for all of us that have employees we care about that needed the support? I can't, I can't in good faith say that. But there is no question. Um, I've got a, you know, just on a, quickly on a personal, we've got a show, a small show. We're moving into Orlando at the same time as MRO. It's a 20 man labor call. Uh, we've had a heck of a time filling that call because, you know, folks that worked for me consistently that made, you know, 60, 70, $80,000 a year won't come back and leave what they're doing for 10 days worth of work, right? They're, they're, they'll either stay on the sideline with unemployment. Yeah, I could make a little bit more, but it seems complicated to get off unemployment then go back on, or, hey, I'm at Amazon in the warehouse and I'm doing okay. So call, is this a full-time job? No, it's not. Will you pay me off the books? That's another question we're getting. Well, we've got PPP money. And in order to make that a forgivable spend, we've got to run you through the payroll. Well, I'm not willing to do that and give up my side. So anyway, this is uh, this is a major and immediate thing that we're facing on the workforce recovery. Um, we know time is on our side with that, 
But then, you know, those are build shops like classic, right? If you're going to do an intake of new employees, you got to you got to start three to six months beforehand to get your team in, you know, championship playing capacity. I'm I'm sure, um, you know, I'm sure one of the, the dealers on the call that says, hey, I've got a finally got my first sale. And you go, great. We've got a fresh young crop of new guys that are learning to use that saw and they need a project to, tr- to learn on. It's not what people want to hear right now. So those are some of the challenges, Kevin, I think, in front of us. Yeah, we uh, – Hey, Kevin. Hey, 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 yes. Yeah. Fire away. Uh, me? Yeah. Yes. Okay, cool. So, so just another thought on that, Chris, is that, you know, uh, uh, the graduating class of 2020, college graduates that have studied events and, and uh, hospitality for four years, graduated with absolutely no prospects of employment in their chosen field. So the question, and now we're coming up on another round of that. Looks like hiring is loosening up a little bit as we've discussed, but you know, what did, what did that 2020 graduating class go to? They, they probably went into other industries uh, and which other industries are doing pretty well. You know, the, the tech, tech industry and all that sort of thing are doing pretty well. So um, it just, it's just a shame that that, that population of potential employee employees we missed out on as an industry. Yeah, no, it's heartbreaking, Steve. And I, you know what, I, there'll be, I know there will be an opportunity, again, full faith that we're going to see happy days at some point in the future, but you're right. There's um, a year, maybe two years of that crop that we're going to miss here. And at the, the real challenge is at the same time, we've lost a lot of really good tenured, um, institutional knowledge type employees that um, is just amplifying, I think, what, what will be the short-term pain, so. Absolutely. Jen, you were about to say something. Well, I was actually going to engage Steve because I wanted to hear um, if, if he was seeing a similar trend on the, on the ho- hospitality side um, within MGM as far as that workforce, that, that labor force, um, moving on, or if he felt like they were were being able to stay to stay engaged in that side of things a little bit um, differently than than yeah, I, I think Chris hit hit it kind of on the head. Is you know people taking advantage of, of the government assistance. Uh, a, a personal note: we a, a gentleman that I worked with at Mandalay Bay for a bunch of years. I actually bumped into him at the butcher shop in Albertsons because he was let go and he had to find an employment. So I said, hey, let me call your your former uh, superior, your boss, and see what the deal is with. So she called him uh, and offered him part-time work to come back. He's like, I can't do that. I I got, got, I'm getting benefits here with what I'm doing. I can't do part-time work. So that's the challenge, as Chris said, you know, when this ramps up, it's not gonna be full-time for a lot of people, it's gonna be part-time work. And even though it might be more pay, the benefits are key, especially if you have a family. Mm-hmm. So that's that's gonna be a huge challenge. And this guy was great. You know, you'd want him on your team and he just, he, he looked at it and said, what's, what's the most more beneficial option to me and my family? And it was to stay full-time at the butcher shop at Albertsons rather than coming back and, and doing what he was doing at Mandalay Bay. Sure. We got, I, I'm going to take a couple more minutes here, but before I do that, I've, I've got a couple crystal ball questions I'd like to ask all the panelists, but um, Mel, uh, was there any, any particular questions that uh, came up during today's uh, talk that you would love, like to address? Um, I don't, but, but I have a question, I think, and a couple people alluded to it um, in their, their sessions, and that is, you know, how do we give exhibitors a bigger voice? Because technically, technically, exhibitors don't have an association. I mean, they have no one advocating for them. Yes, they're on kind of exhibitor councils at, at certain shows, but they don't really have a voice as far as the the trade show industry, how it's moving, um, what can be changed. I mean, does anybody have any ideas on how do we give them a greater say in the recovery? I'm going to go to the customer first and say, Michael, what, what, what would that look like for you? What would you like to see as, as, as all of our customers, representing all of our customers and users on this call, to have a voice, a meaningful voice? What, does that, what would that look like? Well, I, I guess for, as an exhibitor, 
to me, it, 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 the voice has the sound of transparency to it, okay? Um, too much, from, from my perspective, I'm blindsided by, okay? Um, someone mentioned the 53% over budget. Uh, I had to chuckle, that's low, okay? Because you, you just don't know what's going on. So, so if we had a voice, somewhere we would be involved in this, this process of, of design and, and how, how these things are, how things are, are charged. I really don't want to say that, but, but how are these decisions made on, on what's in the building, what's in the warehouse? Oh, Klein, you got to pay extra because it's not here on the floor. And oh, you wanted white and you got blue. Well, it's going to cost extra to move it all around. Those are the things that, as an exhibitor, that, that drive you crazy. So we need a voice in, in, in the service side of this whole thing, okay? Uh, you need to hear from us what our concept of service is. Because I think sometimes our concept and the industry's concept are, are two different things, okay? Does that make any kind of sense? Um, service, it all comes down to service. I'm willing to pay for service, okay? But the two have to go hand in hand, right? Um, and, 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 and that's where I think we need a voice, is on the service side. I like the word uh, transparency. Um, I think the transparency is critical um, for suppliers, uh, all from the supplier side all the way through to the, um, um, the exhibitor side. But uh, any of the panelists want to talk about that as far as um, um, you know, the, the, the missing voice for um, the exhibitors in large part. Martha? Yeah, sure. So um, I, I lean on Randy Aker at Exhibitor Media Group. Um, they do a lot of great surveying. They, they stay as close to the exhibitors across all media, all different um, category of exhibitor, right? Um, better than anyone else I know. So when I have uh, questions or when I want to get a, a read on the sentiment, I go to, to them. And uh, they I think they've done a phenomenal job putting surveys out in the field this year, especially during this um, COVID. And he's, uh, he's very open to sharing his information. And I feel like if, uh, if there was a coalition of of this group who said, we have some very specific questions we want answers to, and you went to the went to Randy and his team. They would put a survey out. What about? Uh, I totally agree with you. Um, number one, they've done a great job. Um, uh, I want to go to Dasher. Dasher, um, kind of address. Um, uh, I know this is a hot topic within EDPA, and there's been a lot of work that's gone into exhibitor advocacy and is continuing to develop. Talk a little bit about what um, what you guys are working on. Yeah, I mean, if you look over in the chat, I, I think Nicole first posted it over there, um, but there is actually a conversation happening tomorrow. Our Texas chapter um, is uh, having an exhibitor advocacy um, call tomorrow afternoon, and there was a uh, white paper that was developed by the exhibitor advocacy group. Um, Amanda Helgamo, who's um, on the board of directors for EDPA, as well as uh, leads our uh, exhibitor advocacy um, committee, um, she worked with the, uh, the exhibitor advocacy group, a number of companies, I think over 20 companies um, authored this together, um, which is really calling for, uh, you know, the transparency and the reform that uh, we've been talking about it for, for years and years. Um, the good news is there's conversations that are happening, um, you know, being facilitated by, uh, by, by the associations, uh, EDPA going to um, CISO and, uh, and ESCA um, and IAVM and, and others to, to, to share this information um, to bring transparency to the, to the industry. I think, you know, as we get back to work, now more important than ever, that's, uh, that's going to be a critical part of it. So, um, you know, it's open for everybody to join uh, that conversation. Uh, if you look over in the chat, you can see the links to, to register and I encourage everybody to do so. Awesome. Thank you, Dasher. So um, a couple rapid fire questions just to kind of close this out and, and I'll go around to each panelist to answer them and, and they're totally different and, and doesn't can be a short answer, but um, crystal ball thoughts. Um, but common questions that we saw. Um, what markets do you anticipate 
to rebound the strongest and fastest. Uh, that's one. And then the other big one is uh, from each of your perspectives, no right or wrong answer. Um, do you anticipate sometime here in the next year that uh, COVID IDs will be required to get into events? Those two, I'm going to start with uh, Chris because you're in my upper left hand corner. And Chris just turned his camera off. He doesn't want to answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. Uh, Mike Davis reminded me that his attorney says we don't have to answer questions like that anymore. So, uh, no, listen, um, you know, first of all, the second one first, I, will there be a COVID passport or a wristband or something? I, I think, um, you know, I've, I've never been on, on the privacy bandwagon about that. If I, I've, I get my second shot in a week, I've got my card in my pocket. If I have to flash a card or if I flash a card and you give me a wristband, makes it easier for me to get in and out of a show. I have no problem with that. Um, I think it's probably just good business to help get recovery back. Um, what are the long-term consequences of that? I don't know, uh, but, um, you know, I, and I'm sorry, the first part of your question, Kevin, was strong prediction on just stronger. What do you, what do you hear as far as strongest uh, market street to, to return? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm sitting in Orlando right now, and there's obviously been a lot of energy around shows that are happening here. I think what you want to look for when you're looking at markets that are recovering is um, which markets have the convention center facilities, the local and, and county uh, elected officials, and the state governor um, all singing the same song and moving in the same direction. I believe that the reason that Florida, in particular Orlando, was doing so well is when they, they were an early mover at the facility on the GBAC five-star program uh, back in June. They announced they were open. Uh, the governor announced it. The county commissioners were behind, behind it. And they never stopped moving forward. It didn't mean there was any demand, right? But that was happening. And there is some data, guys, that shows once that happens in a market, it's three to six months or so of that consistent messaging and announcing, you will begin to see some bookings. And there is some data that show, and larger shows could be as, as long as six to nine months because of the planning. But when I looked at, um, so June, right? March this year, we had, uh, we, saw, we saw Mr. Olympia with 29 days notice left Las Vegas and showed up in, in Orlando just because it was a more certain, uh, and cooperative business environment. Uh, we saw shows co-locating in March. Didn't happen, but they made that decision months before. One was San Diego, one was in Indianapolis, but they came to Orlando. So I think shows, associations are gonna be looking for those um, venue cities that, that have all three of those things moving in the same direction. So that's what I'd be watching if you're looking for comeback cities. Awesome, thanks Chris. Uh, Mike Davis. Yeah, look, I'd agree with Chris. I, I, I think that there are the markets that have already established themselves and, and so to speak, put out the welcome at Texas, Florida, uh, especially. I think what we could end up seeing, too, is we could see some of these, I don't want to call them second tier markets because they're not, but maybe these mid tier markets that had made significant investments, take Nashville and some other ones that had made significant investments pre pandemic that didn't necessarily get the rotation that they were hoping for for some of the shows to be beneficiaries of this as well, because they tend to be in those states where they've come to a consensus as to how they're going to open up, when they're going to open up, and kind of gotten everybody on board. So I think, I think it's going to be a combination of the states that are very apparent and also some surprises for us as we go along, especially if uh, show organizers and show managers decide that they're going to uh, move some of the pre-existing venues that they've been going to before, which I, I, I think is gonna happen. I just think that's gonna be a natural occurrence in this as well. I think COVID, I, I think the ID part's gonna be a mixed bag. I think it's gonna just be one of those things where some will adopt it, some will make it mandatory, some won't, some won't need it whatsoever. Um, I think it's just gonna be an opt-in, opt-out program. I think somebody like Clear you know, that type of company that's able to kind of come in and out of that without substantial investment is going to do well. Um, I do want to go back just real quick to the question about the customer and the, the exhibitors was I think one of the responsibilities that, that we try to take on as an organization, certainly for me, is that when I'm meeting with my customer, whether it's 
a general contractor or an exhibit house, I try to also be an influencer and a voice for our experience directly with the customer as well, is to say, you know, take this as you'll take it, but this is also what we're hearing in these situations. So that there's just another view sometimes um, that they're not necessarily hearing from us. So that we're able to say, look, we're doing this a little different over here. It seems to be working. Uh, and I think that's, that's an opportunity too with those trusted uh, partners to be an influencer um, for those voices that may not make it all the way up there. Good point, Steve. Uh, I, I, my prediction is that um, right now the corporate events are kind of sitting on the sidelines and, and because they can, right? Because typically when they do their events, it, it's an expense to their company. Whereas the, the association, the trade show, that's how they make their money. So I think once we get into 2022, all that's going to kind of loosen up. And I think you're going to see the corporate events really come flying off the shelves. Uh, and it's going to benefit uh, many destinations, obviously Las Vegas, but like Mike mentioned, Nashville and Austin, some of those uh, up and coming second and third tier cities. So I think as the, the trade show organizers need to really keep an eye on that ball and, and lock down their space long term because it's going to get, you know, there's going to be a little bit of elbowing and jockeying for space as we get as we look into the future. Uh, the COVID, the COVID, uh, man, I'm, I, I don't know what, I don't know which direction we're going on that. It's like you, we're offering COVID test or vaccinations on, at our properties, but we, it's not mandatory for our employees. So, you know, can you say you have to carry around your thing? I mean, if you get vaccinated, why wouldn't you? But uh, I don't, I don't know that's going to be mandatory anytime soon. Okay. Martha. Well, yeah. you know, from my, Oh, I thought you said Michael. I apologize. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Martha. A little uh, break think, up on uh, the audio. Yeah, I think uh, I think Vegas. I think they're going to come back fast and strong. And um, I think uh, COVID IDs is. Um, I'm a cynic. I think it's public safety theater. I think we're just doing it to make ourselves feel better. Um, and uh, I want to just thank everyone so much for inviting me. I have a 2.30, I have to jump, but thank you very much. It was a pleasure chatting with all of you. Thank you, Martha. Uh, Michael, go ahead. Okay. From, from this side, and it, it was showing up in the chat, you know, there's a corporate travel ban. I, I had to validate my need to be in Miami in May, okay? So and, until something like that happened, we're handcuffed from this side of, of, of the table. Uh, when it comes to an ID, I agree with Chris. If it makes it easier, let's just do it, okay? I already carry a driver's license. I have a social security number. I have a passport. I can fit one more thing in there, you know? I can carry a COVID ID. It's not a big deal. Um, recovery, recovery, um, you just gotta be patient, you know? Uh, it, it's going to come back. I believe it. Uh, it'll come back before I retire and walk away. So I'm excited. <laughs> Thank you. And Dasher, round them out. Yeah, I'll just, uh, I think, you know, as far as uh, the locations, I think Chris and, 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 and Michael and the others all address that. Um, you know, as far as the IDs, I think what you're, we're really talking about is, is vaccination requirement. And I think, you know, that's going to be just uh, like anything else, it's going to be uh, the large corporations that are going to dictate that and everybody else will follow. We saw that with the travel bans. We're going to see the same thing with the IDs. If the airlines require um, vaccination requirements, you'll, you, you can bet that everybody's uh, going to uh, follow suit. If the, uh, the major corporations, uh, you know, um, out there, the uh, the Amazons, the Apples, the uh, Salesforce, and all of them um, require their employees to get vaccinated. The rest will follow. So, thanks, Dasher. Um, well, before we close up, Mel, uh, you want to kind of want to wind us down? Um, yes, I just want to thank the speakers um, and certainly thank everyone who's still on the call and those who attended early on. But a huge thanks to Jen. Jen pulled this all together, got the speakers together. Um, and so Jen, a great idea. It was Jen's idea and Jen did the organization. So uh, everyone out there, 
just the, the, the five second commercial. If there's anything classic can do for you, please give us a call. We're here and we're waiting. Right. Appreciate you guys so very much. Um, I wish we could stay on for another hour and a half, but I know we got things to do, but it was so great to see your faces. Thank you everyone for, for um, making this so um, meaningful and, and uh, yeah. Thanks. Absolutely. And our, and our conversation groups, they'll know who you are. Um, look for some invites for next month coming up soon, but this was great to have everybody together as, uh, as one. So I'll give you guys back the rest of your day. Hope um, you have a fantastic week and uh, this has been fun. Thanks for giving us so much time and panelists. Thank you so much for well, just being who we are and being great, great, uh, great partners. Yeah. Cheers guys. Thank you. Thank Thanks. You. It was a lot of fun. Uh, yeah. All right. Appreciate it. Well, take care. Bye.